Chencho Dawan. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Matthew Papo, a software engineer at Cisco. I'm Wei Go Sang. I'm a tech, tech lead at Cisco Cloud Service. And today we're going to talk to you about RabbitMQ at scale and a lot of lessons we learned. Um, a few of our other colleagues that contributed to this presentation but aren't here today are Wei, Scott, and Carrie. So to give you a little idea about our environment, uh, we run an over-cloud and an under-cloud. So we are virtualizing the entire control plane for our tenant cloud inside of another OpenStack cloud. So our tenant cloud has over 800 Nova compute nodes, over 700 routers, 1,000 plus networks, and over 10,000 ports. Um, each OpenStack service we run inside of the tenant cloud um, runs on three controller VMs, and we're supporting Neutron, OVS, and L3 agent. Our RabbitMQ cluster consists of uh, three, four vCPU, eight gigabyte of RAM, and we run these in an active-active cluster. So we're not running HA proxy or pacemaker in front of the Rabbit node. All of the clients are directly connecting to Rabbit itself. We're running this on Red Hat 7 with uh, Rabbit 335-22 and Erlang 16. Uh, one thing to note is we are pulling these packages from Red Hat OSP, so although it's uh, RabbitMQ 335, there's actually a lot of performance and stability backports that Red Hat does for us. And we're supporting Icehouse and Juno clients. So th this does not include any heartbeat of QRS. So when things go wrong. So when you start running into scale issues with Rabbit, uh, the first thing you'll probably start noticing is your compute services start flapping up and down. Instances may fail to boot. Uh, you'll be waiting for a port binding. The neutron agents may start timing out, and you'll start seeing errors, you know, timeout waiting on an RPC response. And if you start checking the RabbitMQ queues, you'll start noticing that messages are backing up. This is never a good sign. So the first thing you may think is, let me just go and restart everything. And unfortunately, if you're running into scale issues, this can actually just compound everything. And you may actually just melt down everything and end up having to stop the whole cluster and bring up the services one at a time. So in our early days, we started, we were using all the default settings for RPC and Rabbit, and our cluster grew a lot larger than we expected. And we click, quickly realized that RabbitMQ was our bottleneck, and we needed to do some configuration tuning to fix that. So the first thing we jumped into was the client-side configuration around Rabbit. So particularly around the Nova and Neutron client configurations, there are a lot of things we had to do specifically around enlarging the RPC pool, so increasing the thread pool size and the connection pool size, and also extending the timeouts. So the default RPC response timeouts are around 60 seconds, but with really large neutron stacks, it's not nearly enough because it needs to go and pool all of the networks, the subnets, the ports, the bindings, and some of these calls from the DHCP agent and L3 agent for getting the active network information and syncing state can take much longer than 60 seconds to respond. So we've actually extended this much, much larger to 960. There were some performance optimizations in Kilo that were backported a little bit that seemed to help, but we still needed to expand it. Another thing that we really needed to do was increase the amount of RPC workers. So we currently have this tuned to around four per each controller. So we, like I said, we have three Neutron servers, but they will be running four workers each. So just to give you an idea on the impact that would make, with like three Neutron RPC workers originally, if there were 10,000 messages in the backlog, this could take almost an hour for the Neutron server to catch up and process all the messages. When we increased that six-fold to 18, we saw it was very quickly. It could consume all the messages, catch up, and then the cluster was much more stable. So even with the RPC tuning, we were seeing frequent disconnects and reconnects with Rabbit. You would see these 404 errors for Q not found. And unfortunately, when it was stuck in the state, we would have to go and restart the agents. And running OVS pre-Liberty, when you restart OVS, you essentially have to reload all the flows. And our clients love it when you unplug their VMs on them. <laughs> So we quickly determined that we're running into basically a race condition that was happening with these auto-delete queues. And so before Juno, auto-delete was not really an option we could even set in Neutron. And so all these queues were automatically defined with auto-delete. And so what could happen is if, you know, if a rabbit node went down and the clients need to reconnect, there would be a race condition with the queue declaration and the consumer actually binding to the queue and RabbitMQ deciding, hey, I don't see any consumers. I'm going to go delete this queue. So we backported some Oslo drivers that really helped stabilize that. And on the Neutron side, 
we had to do, we found some combo driver improvements that really help. So particularly one of the patches we found from the Ubuntu Cloud Archive, um, really it added basically some exception handling to determine that, hey, if I see this 404 error, let me go and redeclare the queue because it's likely deleted because of this HA cluster failover. So it would essentially go in there and then have the consumer reconnect. However, we were noticing, although the queue is getting redeclared and reconnected, um, he wasn't actually consuming. So we had to add a few more little lines there that would actually go and help him consume. So we were, even with the, the tuning on the client side, we were still never got to the root of the problem. Like, why, what was actually causing these connection issues? So that's when we decided to actually start digging deeply into Rabbit. So particularly some of the important things we dug into was this Erlang configuration. There's a few options in the Erlang arguments that you can add that are important to add on, especially the, the keep alive settings and adding this plus A for 128, which sets the Erlang VM IO thread pool size. So they, Rabbit recommends you set this to at least 128. Another common configuration recommendation that we had was this TCP user timeout, this raw 8 or 618 5000. And this basically sets the TCP user timeout to five seconds with the idea that we'll quickly detect when an established connection fails. This is outside of using like a keep alive or something. However, this actually causes a lot of issues. So important thing to note, if you are setting this TCP user timeout, it'll actually override any keep alive timers if it's shorter. And what we discovered is that if you were to drop a single packet and you had this set, it would actually trigger a socket teardown on Rabbit. You would see this error, this INET error for e timed out. We were seeing this happen between Rabbit and the clients or even between the cluster itself. Um, another important thing to note that in Liberty, there were some uh, QoS options added that are really important. Um, basically, you can limit the amount of messages a consumer actually accepts off the queue. Otherwise, for instance, if you had a queue with uh, many messages backed up and a consumer connects for the first time, all of the messages are going to be flushed to, flush to that client. And now if you had this TCP user timeout setting there too, the client could just be busy trying to catch up and digest everything, but from the server side, he's like, I didn't get a response, so I'm gonna go whack the connection. And he'd actually go and close the connection on a, a, a healthy client. So another thing to note is, since we're virtualizing the control plane um, in KVM, uh, there's a default KVM transmission queue link that's set, and it's really tiny. It's only 500 packets. And so what we noticed is that um, with a busy rabbit cluster, this buffer could actually overflow and you'd start dropping packets. And so if you didn't actually increase the transmission queue length, um, you'd drop a packet and if you had this TCP user timeout set, same thing would happen. You'd actually be triggering disconnects that you really didn't want. So we really recommend that you increase this transmission queue length. We, we recommend setting it to 10,000. The amount of memory you're gonna actually use is negligible. And one important thing to note is that this parameter isn't really, you can't set it in KVM or Nova. It's something you actually have to do on the hypervisor side. So we recommend you add a UDEV rule to set the tap interface transmission queue length. So we recommend setting it to 10,000. You can do this on the fly or you can set the UDEV rule so that when a VM is brought up, it'll automatically get set. Um, between adjusting the transmission queue length and actually removing that TCP user timeout, that actually helped address a lot of the disconnect issues we were seeing at a scale, a large scale cluster. Yeah, let me make a point here. Um, excuse me, man. So between these two, you, you realize one, the TCP timeout is actually, um, the user timeout is actually the underlying cause because you can't tolerate a single pack loss. The tab interface setting on the KVM for the virtualized uh, rabbit nodes it's one actually occasionally causing the drop of the packet. So by tuning both of these, hopefully you avoid any packet loss or even uh, the underlying TCP IP stack can tolerate a single packet loss, which is, you know, in, even in a da uh, data center network, that could still happen from time to time, a single packet loss. So uh, certainly if you virtualize your uh, control plane, that's something you want to take into consideration. Yeah, so if, if you pull up if config on the tap device, so the thing you want to basically look for under transmission errors, if you see if there's anything dropped. If, if, if it's greater than zero, then you probably want to increase that buffer. Some other things to keep in mind if you're virtualizing control plane is you never want to suspend a rabbit VM because when he actually resumes, he thinks he's still healthy and it'll actually cause a partition. Um, 
And you also want to monitor the hypervisor for any underlying issues. So pay attention to anything like a CPU soft lockup or disk or memory contention or RAID or I.O. controller resets, because all of these can cause you know, a little skip under, in the underlying VM, and then all of a sudden he's out of sync with the cluster. So moving on to some of the RabbitMQ configuration options we've also working with. So um, some of the important things that we set were our cluster partition handling. Um, we set pause minority. We'll come and talk about that in a little bit. And we also make sure you want to set a high watermark. So in our case, we set it to 0.4, which, which allows 3.2 gigs of RAM for a rabbit, which is more than enough. If, if rabbit's consuming more than a gig of RAM, I mean, we're having issues. And so increasing the high watermark is just basically delaying the inevitable. So we set it to 0.4. Some other important options are um, setting this reuse address to true. It will re reuse sockets that are in the time wait, but do note that this is not really safe if you're netting any of your connections to Rabbit. And also you want to do uh, no delay to for true, which disables Nagel's algorithm for increased throughput as it doesn't have to do TCP processing on every packet. And we also enable keep alive for true. Um, also, there's some process level tuning you want to make sure you do, mainly around the file descriptors. The default Linux distro, sometimes it only allows 1,000 file descriptors for Rabbit, and we want to set that to at least 65K or more. So this allows a lot more connections and queues and messages to build up without being trim. And basically, all the other limits, too, we just set them to unlimited. Basically, we want to guarantee that on the VM, RabbitMQ has all the resources available to them. If you want to check your current process limits, you can run this command, at least for Red Hat and CentOS, and it'll tell you what everything's set. And like we said, we recommend just maxing everything out to, to unlimited. So back to partition handling. So the choice between pause minority and auto healing. So it essentially comes down to the cap theorem. We're either going to sacrifice consistency or availability of the cluster. And so in our findings, we really don't think that an inconsistent cluster is actually useful in OpenStack. We, we feel like consistency is more important than availability, being that if, if a node is connected to the minority, he's going to have to actually fail over to another one. But we feel that's more important than being available. Um, one thing to note, if you are using pause minority, is it requires a quorum. So if there's only one node alive, he's going to pause. So if you're doing maintenance on a, a cluster and you bring two of the nodes now, you're going to cause an issue. So Always keep that in mind if you set pause minority. And both auto heal and pause minority are not perfect. They both have their issues. Um, so you really need to have your own kind of partition monitoring and alerting, which we'll talk about a little later. It's also really useful to have automation to kind of restore a partition. Um, if you can go and identify which the minority node is, you can just go and wipe the amnesia database from that rabbit and restart rabbit, and he will go and resync and join the cluster back over again. So next, on to queue mirroring. So this is something that's set by default by the RabbitMQ policy. Um, you will see in some of the legacy configurations on the client side that you have the setting for Rabbit HAQs. This actually doesn't do anything after Rabbit 3.0. All the queue mirroring policies are only set on Rabbit and queue policies. It's not set in the client configuration. So just keep in mind that that configuration on a client doesn't do anything. Another really important thing to note is that Q mirroring is really not needed. Um, it's not needed for RPC, and it's really expensive. There's a two to three times performance hit you take if you have Q mirroring turned on. So you can actually turn this off, and your cluster will work fine, because Rabbit itself will route your message through. If you're connected to you know, Rabbit 3, but your, your queue's on one, he'll actually route your messages through. And so we really recommend that you only mirror some of the billing, billing queues, the notification queues, anything that you really don't want to sacrifice possibly losing. And there's also some examples in Liberty that, that show you can do this without queue mirroring. So one thing to note, if you want to change your policy where you have previously mirrored and you want to turn off queue mirroring, uh, you'll likely need to restart the cluster. Although you can set the policies on the fly, um, for them to fully take effect, we, we noticed we had to actually restart the cluster. So on to some operating system tuning. Um, Default TCP settings are really not ideal. Um, we're talking over two hours when you have TCP Keep Alive turned on by default before you even sends a probe packet to see if the connection's still alive. 
So we adjusted these packets, and it really, really helped the clients fail over when a rabbit node went down. So we really recommend um, setting the keep alive time to five seconds and setting it to five probes with a one second interval, and also setting the TCP to retries to. This really helped improve um, the clients determining if there was an issue with Rabbit and then deciding to, okay, I'm gonna go connect to the next one. So next, on to monitoring RabbitMQ. Um, we use RabbitMQ admin to monitor the health check and we basically wanna make sure we query each node for this, the cluster health and partition status. Sometimes when a cluster does get partitioned, you can have one node think that he's okay, but the other two have a different meaning for it. So when you do do your checks, you wanna make sure that you set them up for all three, not just one of them. Some of the things we measure are the Erlang memory utilization versus the high watermark, number of file descriptors used, sockets used, process utilization, the system memory, disk utilization, and the queues and number of unact messages. Uh, whenever there's any messages building up, you want, maybe wanna set a threshold to like, if it's something greater than 20 or 30 messages, maybe trigger an alarm because messages backed up are, are always a sign of a problem. Um, you also wanna make sure you look through the RabbitMQ logs because you'll always see this alarm set go off, basically saying, hey, no co connections are gonna get accepted until this alarm clears. And right before that, he'll tell you why it's going off. He'll tell you, oh, maybe you, you're out of file descriptors or, or you're out of memory. So always important to look at that. In addition to just using RabbitMQ admin for a lot of the monitoring, we also run a lot of synthetic testing. So we have synthetic testing that's constantly sitting there basically booting a VM, create a router, network, attach to the VM, and ping the VM. If it works, tear everything down, we're good. Do it again. Create a volume, delete a volume. Upload an image. And a lot of times, if you see a failure in this synthetic testing, he's kind of hinting that maybe something could be wrong underneath with Rabbit. So it's really useful to have a, either a cron job or something running in the background constantly do that. So on to some various Rabbit tips. Uh, using RabbitMQ admin instead of RabbitMQ CTL command. So before 3.6, the, the RabbitMQ CTL, like list commands, were, did not actually stream. So it would actually sit there and buffer the entire result. And so you'd notice if, like, if you have a stuck queue or something, you'll try and run RabbitMQ CTL list queues, and it'll sit there and hang forever and ever and ever. So we really recommend you use the admin interface, the RabbitMQ admin command, because he actually talks REST to a, a lightweight HTTP server, and he'll return the results. And he also uses a, a different underlying Erlang VM, and it doesn't put as much stress on the system. Some other important things to do are you wanna make sure you monitor the memory management of the stats database. This can eat up a lot of memory, and if it does, you can actually go terminate it on the fly. It it's, will not hurt a production cluster. It doesn't affect anything else besides statistics. And if you are running a large cluster, we'd recommend disabling the UI if you really don't need it. You can pull everything from the API, or if you can't disable the UI, you definitely want to at least adjust the statistics collection interval. At default, it pulls every five seconds, and this is really intensive. So you can also adjust this on the fly by just setting this command. We recommend sending it to like 60 seconds or, or more. Some other tips. Uh, you definitely want to set a policy for QTTL. You set this with expires and the number of milliseconds. Um, just set it so to something greater than the RPC message timeouts. So if there's zero consumers, Rabbit will go in there and clean up it for you. Um, this is really useful for cleaning up orphan queues. So sometimes if a hypervisor goes down or something, you'll have a queue that'll sit there and constantly be piling up more and more messages and eat up a lot of your memory. And by just setting a policy, you can have Rabbit go and clean those up for you. Another thing is don't use auto-delete queues if you have the option. It's, it's much safer to just use a QTTL and have Rabbit go and clean it up for you. Because like we said earlier, when, when a node fails over, sometimes there's a race condition that hasn't been totally solved about. Rabbit decides I'm gonna go auto-delete this before someone else actually binds. And if you do see lots of reconnects between the client and server, um, you wanna investigate more into the RPC tuning and definitely look into your network stack to see if there's any errors. Another tip is um, by default, when you set the Rabbit hosts list on, on the client side, uh, he normally will always connect to the first host in the list. So if you were to go restart a whole stack, they're all gonna try and connect to Rabbit one. So, one little trick you can do is basically just randomize the order across different services so that it's not always rabbit one, two, three. So that, that way, if you restart all the services, they'll actually kind of distribute the load a little bit better for you. <clears throat> 
So architectural decisions. If we could go back and redo things from the beginning, we probably would not use a single rabbit cluster for all the services. We would definitely at least take the chatty services, maybe stuff like Salometer and Heat, and put those on a separate cluster. There's no need to put everything in one because you're just asking for failure. So it's better off to you know, limit your domains so that if one thing fails, it doesn't affect all of your services. And so th those things were, were really helpful in us tuning and actually supporting a, a very large cluster. Uh, there's also a lot of good resources out there. Um, there were some good talks in Austin on troubleshooting Oslo that go into depth on how to debug Oslo issues. So I recommend you check those out. And there's also some other talks on, from Tokyo that were good on Rabbit. And lastly, also check out the RabbitMQ users group. There's, you can search all archive of messages and you can reach out to the RabbitMQ developers and ask them any questions you have. So it's really useful resources. Um, with that, we want to turn it over for questions. If you can, please come up to a microphone and ask questions so that we can get them on the recording as well. Whether it's really possible to have a, another RabbitMQ cluster for Silometer, or you just, whether you implemented that? Would, uh, you were showing two different clusters, one for Nova Glance mm -hmm. Neutron and the other one for Silometer Heat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You actually implemented that. Uh, no, but we would, I guess. Or we would even take but separate the, services. Whether it's possible in general. In, uh, uh. Yeah, it should be possible. Yeah. The services are all independent of each other, so they, there should be no need for them to actually talk to each other on the same cluster. Yeah. You say that you change the TCP parameters to use uh, TCP keep alive. And yes. Did you try to use uh, RabbitMQ heartbeat? Uh, so in Icehouse and Juno, we didn't actually have the heartbeats available to us. Yeah, that they weren't implemented yet. And I know there were some issues also in. Up to Liberty, we heard even there's that some, lots of issues still, still there. Okay. So I think that's the recommendation why the TCP Cape Live was originally introduced to, uh, as a recommendation from you know, many experts that you should have that. Uh, but on top of that, uh, that's why the, the TCP user timeout also being recommended. That one we actually found out in reality, it's hurt us rather than help us. So certainly if you don't, uh, even right now, because we don't have a perfect solution for the, t uh, the heartbeat solution, even at uh, layer four and above, so you should probably should also still tune our TCP cable live um, at TCP uh, IP stack level. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, you mentioned in the slide that um, not all the queues has to be HA, just only the notification queues. So I'm just wondering how to differentiate. So do you have a list of which well, one is safe to be not HA? So we really, you only really need to do like notifications and and salometer if it's something that you use it for billing. Like if, if, if you losing the messages would cause you to lose some billing information, most people don't like that. So those are the only ones we really recommend it. You don't actually have to do it for any of them though. So yeah. RPC, all the RPC calls within OpenStack will work without you know, turning on Q-mirroring. Which means that you don't have something like a database in consistency like the NOAA if the provisioning is, that, let's say I'm starting a new VM that includes some RPC messaging to the RabbitMQ and in halfway the whole RabbitMQ cluster is going down and you or at least one know that you are losing a, a whole queue. Uh, in this case you you will have a, something like a failed or a stagged entry or a half made job in the, in the middle of the queue. You could but I mean the, the, it's a very small chance that these me most of these messages are extremely like short-lived, they're, they're just being dropped off and delivered right away. It's not like these messages are persisting on Rabbit. They shouldn't be, we, you know, we should be delivering right away. So the, the risk is very small. But yes, if, if there was a cluster failover, you may have maybe an error state for a sec for one VM or something like that. Uh, in majority case also, um, because the, uh, you know, the, the general OpenStack model, they will get reprovisioned um, e either, either at the system level where um, the message will get re-delivered by the, uh, you know, the calling party, if it's RPC, because there's a state check, right? So if, let's say, your Nova node reboot, it lost the message. When they come back up, it will grab the state saying, oh, I'm really supposed to have this VM here, so it's gonna recreate the, 
uh, all the uh, you know ports, all the the VM they need to be on the node. Okay, are you sure that this is this is fully implemented in all the projects that can you recall or redo this kind of stuff? Um, <laughs> At least most of the service we're, we have been uh, implementing internally, the you know the major uh, open stack service, we haven't seen uh, any issue with that. Okay. So, but anyway, if you don't have this AJ turn on for all the queues and prepare with some cleanup scripts, yeah, I think it's certainly that's still a concern uh, overall. If you don't have the AJ, but even you have the AJ, sometimes let's say we. The, our experience is that when you have a problem with RabbitMQ, you, you, you end up having to reboot, restart from scratch. Uh, we rarely see any issues associated with that, because by re restarting it, you lose all the message anyway. All the, all the message uh, in the uh, OpenStack uh, usage pattern where you actually don't, you, it's not non-persistent, right? So they are all transient. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 No, no, you're able. I'm, I'm you sorry. Don't have durable queues, so it's, it's not stored on the disk. No, it's not stored on disk. Yes, correct. Yes. I think one of the things what we run into um, in our environments, like number of ports, uh, the scale. We didn't realize in the beginning all these issues, and once we start growing our environment, uh, we start realizing all the tuning you really want to done ahead of time if possible. So I think that's the you know I would say uh, one point if you. Uh, decide to grow your environment, you want to really look into that ahead of time. So. No. Yeah. Why is that? Why do you Um. I think, in generally, it's not required. It's, it's not needed. Um, majority of the message, um, like I said, I think if the, if the OpenStack said, OK, uh, this message didn't get delivered, when the, when the system restarts, they will resync the state. So I think that's the, the, as a distributed model, you can't guarantee it's always in sync anyway. And the message is short-lived. Once it passes, you know, like a couple, couple of minutes, it's pretty much useless. I need to be redelivered. Okay, great. Thank you. If there's any other questions, feel free to email us and we'll get back to you. Hopefully, this has been useful. Thank you very much. Thanks.